In his chapter in the Geological Society uh, <coughs> Memoir, Origin of Granite, it was published in 1948, uh, <coughs> Bowen noted that H.H. Uh, H. Reed had stated about nine years earlier that the uh, best geologist is he who has seen the most rocks. <clears throat> and Bowen also noted that uh, to a degree uh, this position is tenable, yet Reed himself makes certain unspecified reservations which lead me to imagine that uh, <clears throat> it's less a uh, question of uh, sight than of uh, insight. And that's the subject we'll discuss today. Uh, insights we've gained about the nature of hydrothermal fluids, nebular vapors, and silicate melts from the vantage point of our improved understanding of mineral thermochemistry. And today I'll begin with the uh, constraints that Fallor and associated uh, solid sulfide solid solutions place on <clears throat> the nature of hydrothermal fluids responsible for mineralization in uh, mesothermal polymetallic uh, sulfide ores in silver mining districts from western, north, and south America. We'll then examine limits that defect spinels place on the conditions under which the first solids condense from the vapors at the birth of the solar system, leaving behind the uh, calcium aluminum inclusions found in carbonaceous chondrites. We'll then conclude with a brief discussion of the thermodynamics of facetic pyroxenes and uh, in these calcium aluminum inclusions as a prelude to their providing us with more information about silicate melts. Okay, we begin our examination with uh, <coughs> silver mining districts here with the Keno Hill District in the Yukon Territory of Northern, Territory, uh, Northern Canada, where it's the uh, largest source of primary silver production when it isn't shut in due to low silver prices like those we're experiencing now. Uh, the silver lead zinc sulfide ores of Keno Hill are concentrated in fissure veins in a graphitic uh, quartzite, the Keno Hill quartzite of Mississippi and our Carboniferous aid, uh, Age. Most of the ores associated uh, <clears throat> with the mine workings here indicated by these black dots with uh, colorful names uh, <clears throat> are concentrated over about 15 to 20 kilometers uh, of the distal portion of a much larger fossil uh, Cretaceous uh, hydrothermal system that extends from the Mayo Lake Pluton to the east and out beyond this uh, map area. Now, the main consider, uh, minerals uh, in this, uh, <coughs> these ores are siderite, galena, sphalerite, fluor, pyrite, uh, <coughs> perargerite, and uh, the fluor is virtually free of arsenic, and so it approximates the formula silver, copper, 10, iron, zinc, 2, antimony, 4, sulfur, 13. Uh, the temperature of this main stage of mineralization has been estimated to be between 250 to 310 degrees based on fluid occlusions in quartz and siderite, uh, and this was done by Gregory Lynch uh, uh, at the University of Alberta. And uh, there are secondary minerals in here. They're very uncommon, but they're there, and they become more common in the western ores. Uh, they're mainly stephanite, polybasite, acanthite, wire, silver, and the galena is presently the familiar lead sulfide that we all have come to expect. Uh, <clears throat> Now, these ores, and uh, you know, like many of these fossil hydrothermal systems, uh, you know, exhibit pronounced zoning, uh, you know, the ores and the country rock, pronounced zoning in the system. But in th this case, it's uh, <coughs> of note that the uh, floor shows the same sort of uh, zoning in this east to west uh, pattern. And this is shown in this slide here where we see an average of the microprobe analyses for floors obtained by Gregory Lynch. These are the larger symbols here. And you'll see that uh, from east to west here, uh, east to west, that we have an, a trend of increasing silver over silver plus copper in the floor and decreasing zinc over zinc plus iron in the floor. Uh, and what's interesting here is that I've overlaid on this the uh, compositions of floor in the uh, <coughs> equilibrium with sphalerite, meargerite, and perargerite. Uh, in the quinary system uh, of the sulfides of the metals uh, <clears throat> of uh, silver, copper, zinc, and iron, and uh, the semi-metal antimony. Now, 
Curiously enough, you'll see that six out of eight of these analyses correspond, the averages for the mines correspond to uh, <clears throat> the temperatures that Greg Lynch got for his fluid inclusions for the main stage of mineralization. Well, that's kind of curious. And, you know, it's mysterious to me because if you look at these rocks, you have fluor, yes, and you have perargyrite and sphalerite, but you don't have any margarite. So what's going on here? Why do the fluid inclusion temperatures agree with the fluor isotherm temperatures? Well, the answer is very simple. Fluor is trying to tell you the galena you had originally in this silver mining district had a lot of other stuff in it. It had a lot of silver antimony sulfide, and it's gone. Well, what happened to that? Well, it obviously must have gone into forming, you know, the galena, that silver antimony sulfide becomes very unstable as you cool it, and it goes into forming other minerals. So out comes the silver antimony sulfide, and it forms these, hydro these uh, epithermal minerals we mentioned a minute ago, the stephanite, polybasite, uh, acanthite, wire, silver, minerals of decreasing uh, antimony to silver ratio, relative to the argyrite, indicating that, you know, during that epithermal mineralization, you leaked a lot of the antimony out to the distal portion of the system. And that's common to see these semi-metals in the extreme distal portions of these systems. So anyway, that was interesting, and I thought, well, I better get Greg's samples now and take a look myself. And I had to get them to an intermediary, Nick Foyt, and uh, <clears throat> he'd already sequestered them. And I basically, when I looked at them, I basically cooperated his findings, except that I found a very interesting feature that uh, I wasn't looking for, but was glad to find, and that was this uh, fluor grain here that shows this evidence of them mixing into silver-rich and silver-poor varieties. Well, you'll note that that has in a, an assemblage that includes this mineral ST, or stephanite, and that stephanite is only stable below 197 degrees centigrade. So, in that context, it was very interesting to look at the results of these probe analyses here indicating by these small circles and squares and compare them with what had been calculated previously. And in fact, you'll note that these black small circles, which represent the unmixed products that we were looking at of nature uh, from these homogeneous materials here, that, that those unmixed products agree fairly well with what Mike O'Leary and I predicted would be uh, the compositions back in 1987. But it's important to note in that context that this goes, went completely against the uh, interpretations that were advanced by the spectroscopic uh, community in that time frame. And that was that silver strongly prefers trigonal planar coordination in the fluor structure relative to tetrahedral uh, sites. And that doesn't work. What Mike O'Leary and I found out is that thermodynamically, to do this consistently, you had to uh, have a change in site preference. As you increase the silver, the content of the fluor, the silver starts liking that uh, tetrahedral coordination a lot more than the trigonal planar coordination and actually changes its preference long before you get to uh, a 0.6 silver over copper. Now, 0.6, or that would be six, uh, silvers here, that's the number of trigonal planar sites in the formula unit of fluor. So you don't get anywhere near there before you get these gaps, and the only way to get them there thermodynamically is to violate what had been, you know, the, the established wisdom of the spectroscopic community. And there's a lot of other physical and chemical phenomena which led us to this conclusion, and fortunately my spectroscopic uh, co, you know, co-author here and collaborator, Nick Voigt, he had already uh, come to this conclusion quite independently that this didn't, the old story didn't work, and that's why he sequestered the samples for possible study in the future. Okay, well, so we've said there's a lot of silver in uh, Galena, and it's not preserved, and so <clears throat> where do you go to uh, see evidence of this kind of silver? And one of the great places to do this is in the uh, <clears throat> Holcani Mining District in Peru, which is about 250 kilometers uh, southeast of uh, Lima, and it's been a source of a significant, well, a significant source of copper, uh, silver, lead, uh, <clears throat> and uh, antimony and bismuth uh, mined since uh, Spanish colonial times. Uh, the ore here is uh, concentrated in fracture fillings in uh, Rio 
dayside volcanics that were generated. Uh, it was generated in the late Miocene and uh, magmatism, and it's uh, strongly zoned along the directions of fluid flow, or the inferred directions. And these were largely vertical in the mimosa mind at the uh, <clears throat> northeast, the northwest end of the district, and uh, have a, but they have a large uh, lateral component in the Herminia mind at the southeast end of the district, those being the two uh, active mines today. Now, <clears throat> Phil Cadell uh, documented uh, this zoning uh, with a map of metal ratios here for the Herminia mine, uh, <clears throat> contouring the veins here with these ratios, uh, <clears throat> these uh, veins, the blue curves here, as they appeared at the 330 level in 1975. Now, these metal ratios, of course, are in weight percent for uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, lead and copper and ounces per ton for silver. And what you note, of course, is this strong zoning from the northwest to the southeast uh, over this four kilometers, you see a monotonic increase in the uh, <clears throat> lead to copper ratio. So that goes up continuously. But if you look at the silver lead ratio, that uh, <clears throat> It goes up towards the southeast, but then you hit this maximum uh, above 100, this massive zone of silver dumping, massive silver dumping. And uh, as you go down to the southeast, of course, then it comes back down, and it's in the, uh, the halo of this uh, zone of uh, silver dumping, or Bonanza silver zone, if you like, that you find uh, samples, or Phil found samples, where you see uh, galenas that uh, have more than 90 uh, or 80 mole percent of the silver antimony bismuth sulfide, or at least used to. And here we see an example of one of the, the breakdown products of what used to be a primary uh, mass of galena, and it's now composed mainly of a silver antimony bismuth sulfide known as aramaeite, and uh, it also has uh, lesser amounts of galena, or lead-rich uh, galena, lead sulfide, and then it has uh, a little bit of ruby silver or perargyrite, and then it has also a new uh, sulfa salt, a bismodiaphorite, or the bismuthian equivalent of diaphorite. And uh, so if you look at the, uh, <coughs> these ores, this uh, diaphorite is this lead silver antimony with a little bit of bismuth sulfa salt, and uh, bismodiaphorite or bismuthian diaphorite is this lead silver uh, bismuth sulfa salt. And uh, what we're going to do is then look at the uh, antimony bismuth ratios of other phases, like this Aramaeite, and uh, <clears throat> in this uh, ores, the, the group ores downstream from the zone of silver dumping. And we'll also look at the silver antimony ratios of the uh, Meargerite uh, upstream from this zone of uh, silver dumping. And from that, we can establish that the temperatures at which these reactions we were looking at took place and were frozen in was about 220 degrees based on various systematics, the first of which is the phase diagram for this system, silver antimony sulfide, silver bismuth sulfide, uh, from Shuvo Goshel and myself. And you'll note that the myargerites here kind of limit you to uh, 210 to 215 on the uh, downside and about 235 ratios of the uh, bismuth over bismuth antimony ratio in the uh, Aramaeites and the decomposed masses, it limits you about 235. So that's, uh, we call it 220 for the sake of argument. Uh, we can also do the same thing from this Fluor breakdown reaction we looked at earlier, but here we don't have any uh, FES in the system that we're looking at in this portion of the system. Uh, and we also don't have fluor, you know, the uh, Meargerite in the system. We have this Aramaeite, so we have to replace the uh, Aramaeite, uh, well, Meargerite with Aramaeite, and take into account the antimony bismuth ratios of the, uh, <coughs> of the uh, Aramaeite. Uh, and, but you'll note when we do all this, we get a temperature, again, about 220 degrees. So everything seems to work. There's internal consistency about how much this cooled. So let's summarize what we have observed. And we've observed that we started off with a primary galena that had on the order of 80 mole percent silver antimony bismuth sulfide. And then if we lower the temperature we get down to 300, we see the Galena field has uh, kind of shrunk. And uh, this sulfur salt diaphorite may have appeared, uh, supposedly. Uh, uh, <clears throat> and then if we go down to 220, we basically freeze in the topology we see for these various uh, minerals. Uh, but the Galena 
it's going to continue to lose silver antimony sulfide until it, you know, gets to its lead sulfide content. Uh, we see here the present compositions retaining only a smidgen of uh, this uh, silver antimony bismuth sulfide or matildaite component. Well, this is all very nice uh, story and everything, but the question is, where do you go to do something actually uh, useful? Uh, you know, where you can reconstruct the uh, compositions of the minerals, go to the field and actually create uh, scenarios where you can test things and calibrate mineral fluid equilibria for the real world ore deposit that has all these solid solutions, not just stoichiometric compounds. And the place to do this is conveniently in uh, OFM's backyard in the Coeur d'Alene district in mining, uh, mining district where over a billion ounces of uh, silver have been produced in the uh, <coughs> Silver Valley. Uh, there have been countless number of petrologic investigations, but there's also uh, <coughs> galena-rich uh, ores containing fluor. Well, in the uh, <coughs> Coeur d'Alene uh, mining district, these, uh, we have these uh, very steep, narrow, west and northwest trending veins, many of which have uh, our favorite mineral fluor here uh, associated with uh, typically an antimony ri uh, rich fluor associated with siderite, pyrite, galena, quartz, and sericite, the usual actors. I found uh, sphalerite where the fluor was uh, zincian, uh, and then we have other minerals like the uh, late minerals like chalcopyrite, uh, <coughs> arsenopyrite early, uh, boronite, and then the minerals you usually find in these kinds of deposits. Uh, crystallization order established by earlier workers here uh, was pyrite, arsenopyrite, sphalerite, fluor, galena, and then late stage uh, chalcopyrite boronite. But you'll notice I have a reverse arrow here because uh, <coughs> galena is uh, sometimes before fluor. You see galena shoots cut by fluor siderite veins in the galena mine, for example. And, uh, you know, I came to the conclusion that, that these uh, fluor, siderite, and sphalerite are pretty much uh, synchronous. So, anyway, we're going to look at the ores from the uh, Sunshine, uh, <coughs> uh, Galena, and Lucky Friday uh, mines from these uh, steep northwest, uh, west, uh, <coughs> west and northwest trending veins that were formed in the uh, Cretaceous uh, during a period of isoclinal folding and regional metamorphism that was uh, contemporaneous with uh, granitic plutonism to the south. And uh, in, top, in spite of that deformation of the veins, there was also an early tertiary event where we had uh, northwest trending dextral faulting displacing these things up to 25 kilometers along this Osborne Fault. So these things were very, you know, deformed, and people showed me samples that looked like big samples of slick and slides, you know. And uh, despite all that, I was very lucky to find evidence of uh, retrograde reaction, we'll look at in a minute, uh, this corona feature in one of the samples from a uh, galena-rich uh, ore shoots from the West Chance uh, vein of the uh, Sunshine Mine. Now these samples were supplied to me by a mining geologist there at the time uh, and became a collaborator, uh, Lisa Hardy, uh, and we've worked since then. Anyway, what you note here is this fluor sitting in a sea of galena, and it's surrounded by this mineral boronite, uh, there, there's corona around it, and that corona is partially detached. You can see uh, because of deformation, it's strung out into the thing. But the main thing is to note on the right that you look at this silver X-ray map, and you see that all of the silver is presently in the fluor. There's none of it left in the galena. So the reaction that explains this is really simple, and that is that you take that silver antimony sulfide component in the galena and combine it with, uh, <coughs> uh, you know, the antimony with uh, lead, and uh, you, take the, uh, you take the silver out of this thing and put it into the floor and pull copper out, and that goes into the boronite. So what does this do? This creates a uh, population of really silver-rich galenas, but that has nothing to do with the original deposition. And, uh, you know, so you get this high, uh, the population of high silver galenas you observe in the district, and you also deplete the galena, you just wipe it out of silver, it's gone. So that's what you're looking at today, galena, and that's what we all learned in our textbooks, galena, lead sulfide, right? Well, okay. 
Well, let's run this backwards. We can run it backwards by just doing mass balance and removing the boronite, and from that then, running reaction backwards, we can figure out what the primary compositions of the fluor were in terms of silver-copper ratios, and we can also get a minimum bound on this, what the original silver content of the galena was. Uh, and that's going to be pretty close to what the actual value was when the thing was uh, deposited originally. Uh, <clears throat> well, you can see the results of this exercise here, that these uh, tips of these, this is shown for this west, that uh, coronal sample we saw a minute ago from the West Chance vein. We also see this for a Galena-rich sample from the Gold Hunter vein at the Lucky Friday mine. And the tips of the arrows here represent the average uh, silver over silver plus copper ratios that we see uh, presently. And this is what we, uh, the asterisks represent the compositions or silver copper ratios of the fluors that would we infer from doing this mass balance. Well, we can also do this in other places like the Kalina mine, where these, we mentioned that these fluor siderite uh, veins cut Galena shoots, establishing that the order that, you know, was originally suggested might be questionable. Uh, but the point is that here, if, where, the, uh, where you have these veins cutting the shoots, where the fluors are actually in contact with those uh, Galena shoots, then you have these uh, silver-copper ratios up here, these black uh, filled uh, circles and squares, where you have uh, <clears throat> the parts of the siderite fluor vein not in contact with the shoots. The compositions of the fluors are down here. So you have the same such an enrichment, and you can now work back and reconstruct the mineral compositions uh, quite nicely. And in fact, if you look at this thing with the highest silver, I obtained that just to confirm that from a mineral collection uh, at Harvard where a previous study had been done and discovered that, well, yeah, you do have textural evidence of this same reaction. It just hasn't been observed, you know, or reported. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, Peter Lichtner and I then used uh, these and other constraints on mineralogy, mineral compositions, and other features uh, to produce a model to honor the memory of the late, great Hal Helgeson and his laboratory uh, prediction central. And in this work, uh, we used uh, the uh, databases for uh, solid solutions uh, and the exchange equilibrium among various sulfides and the uh, formation energies of the simple sulfides to, uh, <clears throat> we combine those to enhance the uh, databases for uh, hydrothermal fluid, mineral equilibria, uh, incorporated for stoichiometric sulfides and other minerals then uh, of uh, Soupgret, Slop uh, 98 uh, from uh, Johnson and Schock, and then for uh, stoichiometric uh, sulfa salts, uh, Soltherm from Reed and uh, Palandry. We combine these two, uh, and then, uh, of course, we use the standard methods to calculate fluid species and uh, activities. And uh, you know, Putting these databases together and getting it to actually describe a real-world scenario where you have to reproduce mineral compositions, mineral assemblages, order of crystallization, salinities, all this stuff, it's like making sausage, you know, and, you know, you just keep playing at it until you get something that you think works, and uh, in the end, we got something we thought sort of works, you know, and here we go, here's the results here for the West Chance uh, vein at 300 degrees. Uh, and a gold hunter also at 300 degrees, and uh, this is for a uh, pH of 5, uh, CO2 uh, <clears throat> pressure of 100 bars, uh, and salinities uh, that, that are consistent with uh, the fluid inclusions. And uh, of course, well, you're not supposed to read all this stuff, uh, but the point was we then went around and looked at uh, Keno Hill just to confirm that indeed, if you were going to equilibrate with the porcupine, uh, the mine assemblage at 300 degrees, you better have a very silver-rich galena because otherwise you don't get the composite, you know, it just doesn't work. So we're happy then. We, we came back to home. And uh, so Peter was so excited, he went out and drove this activity species versus uh, pH or log species versus pH diagram. And of course, you'll note the familiar negative one and negative two slopes on this uh, diagram. 
uh, and neutral uh, <laughs> zero slopes for a neutral species. Uh, so anyway, Peter and I thought this was a pretty good uh, <clears throat> start in constraining the compositions of hydrothermal fluids in equilibrium with real world sulfide ore forming assemblages. In fact, we thought it was so good that we might even see how giving it the good goo stamp of Prediction Central. But quite frankly, this is kind of pathetic compared to the melts software because the properties of the minerals, quite frankly, are not as well known. And you need to extend this, again, to make it more general. You need to add gold, uh, <clears throat> uh, bismuth, arsenic, and of course you can have your own list of elements. At a minimum, you have to add all this stuff, right? So anyway, uh, that's very nice, but it raises the question, well, here Galena is very good at changing its colors and leaving us with no evidence of what it originally was when it was deposited. What, what other analogs do we have like that in mineral systems? Well, you know, the most obvious thing to come to mind is, of course, the iron titanium oxides, where even the uh, Don of uh, iron titanium uh, oxide geothermometry, that is Don Lindsley, came to the conclusion that these oxides are like politicians. They either lie incessantly or selectively, but in particular, the Bishop Tuff did not erupt from a thermally zoned magma body. Instead, when you look at one of these piles of ash and you see the increasing temperatures towards the top, it reflects shorter cooling time, shorter times to re-equilibrate. Now, all you have to do is ask, uh, for example, people who've looked at the theoretical issues the, and uh, you know, very careful observers and uh, experimentalists like uh, Mark Giorso or Gil Gualda or uh, Jim Gardner uh, about that. But for our purposes here, something even more obvious to me here is the spinels that were condensed from the primordial you know, solar system, the first condensates. Well, you know, they're always treated as magnesium aluminate. And, well, wait a minute, they could be just like Galena, they could have a lot of this alumina component at the temperatures initially. And this is particularly uh, compelling when you read quotes like this one here, this Spinel teaser from Burley and Jones, which says Spinel is magnesium aluminate with a little bit of other stuff, but no mention of defects. So you get the impression these defects have been quote unquote annealed out by various processes just like in ore deposits. And in fact, if that's the case, maybe these uh, you know, things originally had a lot of this uh, stuff. And in fact, when you read quotes like this from Crot, you, you become convinced of that, that in fact, it just doesn't, what we have in terms of condensation from solar gas doesn't work because melilite undoubtedly comes in after spinel in many, many cases. And how do you explain? Well, you can always appeal to kinetics, and that's been done repeatedly, but the hotter you make it, and for somebody who's dealing with 20 degrees centigrade, and you go up to, you know, 1600 Kelvin, kinetics becomes, you become less impressed with that argument, so you think maybe there's a little bit of this defect spinel component there, maybe there was a lot, and it's come out as you reprocess these things below 1400 Kelvin, where it's very unstable. And so you don't see it today. And what happened to it? Well, there are all these great aluminous phases around that would gobble it up during cooling. Things like grossite, hibonite, uh, melilite, all of these things could gobble it up. And they'd be eager to do so. And those might be, if you stretch your imagination, those might be the cosmochemical equivalents of these epithermal minerals we saw in the mesothermal ore deposits. You know, let's just work that analogy, right? Well, here's the analogy in, <clears throat> for the, uh, this is from Denton Nabel, and it shows what we were talking about here, that melilite is uh, calculated to come in at much about 100 degrees above where uh, a aluminate spinel comes in on this uh, diagram here for uh, <clears throat> uh, condensation from a, a gas of solar composition or gases uh, produced by, uh, <clears throat> a mixture of solar gas with uh, chondritic dust, vaporized chondritic dust. And uh, <clears throat> what you note here again is that discrepancy uh, between calculations and observations. 
And of course, that you know, as we add alumina, if we just start imagining and that's in the spinel, then uh, particularly at six, above 1600K, that's going to become a real problem. We could imagine that these spinel fields are going to be encroaching on these other fields and maybe even replacing things like uh, grossite, uh, hebonite, uh, and melite uh, as the early condensates. So the presence of alumina will only change this and may just invalidate the whole sequence. Of course, to quantify this, of course, we have to uh, resort to thermodynamics again. And here we can uh, treat the mag these uh, magnesium aluminate alumina spinels uh, in terms of specify the state with a uh, composition variable here and uh, two ordering variables, S1 and S2, that describe the long range distribution of aluminum between octahedral and tetrahedral sites and vacancies between octahedral and tetrahedral sites in this. Uh, uh, these uh, cubic uh, structures that, that have, uh, the, well, they have these uh, one tetrahedral and two octahedral uh, sites in the uh, four oxygen uh, formula unit of these uh, FD3M uh, spinels. And of course, then we can use the usual methods of using a uh, Taylor expansion of uh, second degree in these uh, composition ordering variables to describe the vibrational uh, energy, gives energy and the usual methods to describe configurational entropy, you know, uh, excellent X. Uh, <clears throat> but here are the X's we have to substitute in our variables, the X and uh, <clears throat> S1 and S2 ordering variables. And to solve for those, then we just uh, minimize, or we solve for the partial derivatives of the total Gibbs energy here with respect to the uh, ordering variables at constant temperature and composition, and setting those to equal to zero for both of those and solving them iteratively. So for this uh, choice of uh, variables and uh, <clears throat> these assumptions, we produce a nice little composition, a little diagram here, where <clears throat> we see that these Ws represent our regular solution parameters describing mixing on the various end member joins. Uh, <clears throat> and the, uh, the, that's between these end members here, which are the magnesium alumina, alumina uh, end member for normal spinels, where we have uh, all of the uh, aluminum or uh, the octahedral site exclusively occupied aluminum. And then the other two end members here, uh, magnesium aluminate and alumina, in the uh, inverse uh, <coughs> configuration where we have uh, <coughs> all the tetrahedral sites occupied by aluminum. Now, fortunately, we can throw out some of these parameters right away. We can throw this one out for uh, ordering of magnesium and aluminum between, you know, in the, in the magnesium aluminate. Uh, because we'll see the data in a minute that shows that that's unnecessary, and we can throw out the one for aluminum vacancies ordering by analogy here. And in addition, just looking at this diagram, you can see, well, this parameter labeled tet is going to be a lot, lot larger than the one labeled oct, because it describes the mixing of aluminum and uh, vacancies occurring completely for magnesium, that substitution occurring completely on a single site rather than uh, halfway on you know, uh, uh, two sites. So concentrated versus dilute, you know. Uh, so this will be much bigger than this, and these other two are going to have values somewhere in between. So we're going to go into this with some very common sense uh, rules before we try to make things complicated. People have done a very good job of that already. Uh, so <clears throat> if we do that, we get a very good description here of the uh, ordering parameter for uh, distribution of aluminum between tetrahedral uh, octahedral sites is S1, describing the uh, in situ neutron diffraction data of Renfrew and al. and the in situ uh, <clears throat> uh, NMR data of Makawa. Uh, really describes it almost perfectly, except you'll notice I've uh, accommodated the earlier data, probably shouldn't have, but accommodated it uh, as much as I possibly could without violating this better data, more recent comprehensive data. All right, so we can also do this. Uh, <clears throat> we can also get a good fit for the spinel coronum equilibria, the composition of spinel and equilibrium coronum, and we're going to do it with a very simple expression for the uh, equilibrium condition here that is linearized in terms of this quantity 1 minus x squared, uh, and the slope here being minus 3 times the value of the average regular solution parameter, those four that were left. Uh, and we take all the junk and, of course, and then put it into Q, right? And this works really well except at 1400 Kelvin. Here's the 
demonstration that it works really well, except at 1400 Kelvin. And you go, well, what am I going to do? Add more parameters to fix this truly excellent data? Because this is reversed. This is excellent data. We can't just throw it out. But it turns out we don't have to because there was a physicist, Paglia, did uh, neutron diffraction experiments up to 1200 Kelvin, and he found that the uh, aluminate end member that we've been discussing, that this is tetragonal to above 1200 Kelvin. So why not extend this thing up to be between uh, 1473 and 1400? And that would explain why this thing doesn't fit. And uh, so that's what we're going to do. And uh, in order to get this to work, of course, you, 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 there's a certain structure that emerges, which, of course, is very pleasing to me. And that is that this order variable describing the distribution of uh, the vacancies between tetrahedral and octahedral sites, this indicates that you go from something where you strongly prefer the vacancy strongly love octahedral sites at low vacancy contents. They're all in the octahedral sites, but by the time you get to the metastable alumina end member, you have basically a random distribution of aluminum and vacancies between those sites. So in other words, this mineral also shows a dramatic change in site preference with composition, but it's not as dramatic in, as it is in Fallor, where you actually change site preference. But I, it's sort of a mini Fallor effect, if you like. Uh, okay, so <clears throat> when you get done with all this, you think, well, there's all this ordering going on. Things are going to be really complicated, right? I mean, that's what everybody tells you all the time. Well, in the end, no. It turns out the activity composition relations for magnesium aluminate are virtually independent of temperature. I mean, there's some temperature dependence, but that's all assumed within the scale of this diagram with this fat curve for corundum saturation. And there's less of a dependence of uh, activity on temperature, or there is some for the alumina component. And that's kind of nice. And so in the end, you, of course, the big description was it's only a binary. Shouldn't we get a nice, simple diagram for the Gibbs energy? And yes, we do. And there it is. And here we see uh, that, in fact, when we get to high temperatures like 2200, it's about half of uh, the, the, the energy of mixing is about half that of ideal mixing because of a large non-ideal effect. And uh, <clears throat> this, the, of course, it's offset by this uh, excess, you know, this large non-ideal effect. And uh, well, that looks uh, just fine. Uh, so we'll look at that in a minute. But the main takeaway here is that at high temperatures, this thing's getting awfully, the solid solution's getting awfully stable. And so if you go back and let your imagination run wild, you'd say, OK, I'm going to take that old diagram we looked at earlier, and I'm going to put a, I'm going to expand that Spinel field up as I go up in temperature or dust gas ratio, same thing here. And you know, if I get really carried away, I'm going to wipe out grossite. You know, I'm going to wipe out uh, hibonite as the primary condensate. Wipe out all these other minerals. I might even wipe out corundum as the first condensate if I don't watch myself. And of course, you'd say, well, this guy's really nuts. He's getting carried away. But look at this. Here's from example of corundum uh, crystallizing directly or condensing directly on, I mean, of uh, spinel condensing directly on corundum. Beautiful. Well, where's the hibonite? Where's the melolite? It's not there. Well, kinetics again? Well, I don't think so. And this is all over the place. And, you know, OK, well, maybe they're a little fine grain. Maybe you're not going to believe probe analyses. But if you did, you'd say, wait a minute, here we go. Uh, <clears throat> these things from the uh, various uh, corundum-bearing CAIs, which are very rare, by the way, uh, <clears throat> these uh, would imply, you know, if we, some of these probe analyses, some retain a lot of the alumina component. That could be contamination for corundum uh, in the analysis. but. Uh, if you did that, you say, well, sort of a minimum here would be about uh, 1,700 on the, uh, you know, because that's saturated with corundum, that would provide about 1,700 for the minimum temperature of canonical condensation. Minimum. That would be nice. Uh, and if you don't believe that, then even more intriguing is a study of uh, these inclusions in the Acebi chondrite that were done by El Garisi, Ramdor, and other 
very careful petrologic observers where they observed a range of alumina content in spinels in that one inclusion that ranged from zero up to almost 10 mole percent. That's starting to look like galena. What happened, you know, I mean, how do, how do we know that it stopped there originally? It obviously went higher. You can't believe that after 4.8 billion years of reprocessing of an unstable component, it's going to be around. Particularly when you haven't gone about re trying to reconstruct what was originally there by any kind of analysis of the, you know, textures and maybe doing the same kind of things we did on the Coeur d'Alene ores. It, it doesn't ring true to me. Anyway, uh, let's just pretend that we got a number and, and, you know, put this minimum bound in and get an answer to something that might be interesting to people. What were the pressures when we started producing solids? And here, if we took, uh, again, detonable, but this stoichiometric uh, uh, minerals here, uh, except for metallite, if you just take a gas of solar composition, then put that in, that gives you a, a pressure of about 10 to the minus 3.9 bars. Well, it turns out those same people who provided you with that beautiful uh, examples of condensation of spinel before hevonite or uh, melilite or, any, or grossite in that, for that matter, they also provide examples of where it's possible that hevonite crystallized before, or condensed before corundum. And of course, if you then took this seriously and did not take into account the solid solutions, you'd get a pressure uh, much greater than 10 to the minus two bars. And you'd say, well, that's ridiculous. But that would be because you haven't treated this as anything but end member hibonite, calcium aluminate. And that would be a big mistake. That would be very much like treating hornblende as tremolite. And most of us know that's not a good idea. Uh, anyway. And particularly because there's a lot of junk in this other stuff. You've got magnesium and titanium 4 plus, and that stuff is concentrated on sites of low multiplicity. So it doesn't take a lot to lower the activities a lot and expand the hymenite field as drawn here from this thing here, perhaps down to here. So you'd probably get an upper bound somewhere up here. Well, there's a lot of evidence to support this. Uh, uh, here's the hibonite. Uh, we're not going to spend a lot of time on that, but the main thing is this main substitution of magnesium, titanium, 4 plus for aluminum. This is the main thing we see preserved today. But how much of it's preserved is, again, an open question. Uh, and, but that the, uh, the uh, atoms in those substitution, the magnesium and titanium, 4 plus, are concentrated on sites M3, M2, sites of low multiplicity. And, but, of course, you have other junk in there, too. You've got, many people know, you've got blue hibonite. So, the blue hibonites due to titanium, so three plus substituting for aluminum. Okay, so if we, if we take all this into account, just this N uh, equal 0.8 here would be enough to lower the activity on the order of 85 mole percent. Now that's not pure hibonite. You cannot just treat these things as stoichiometric compounds. You've got to deal with the solid solutions and, you know, basically all of this stuff could be invalidated. All these sequences could be all wrong. We've got to put the solid solutions in there. And that's just one thing that we have to do to get this kind of uh, mineral vapor equilibria to bring it up to the standards of the melts platform, for example, where there's ample provisions for all of these uh, solid solutions. And that's the point. You've got to get things that work. Okay, I'm sure that Catherine's going to tell me I'm about to run out of time. I don't know if I am. Can we? Uh, How much? I, I don't know. Well, okay. Uh, I, quickly, 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 okay. quickly. So I have a little time to discuss the favorite f subject of today, and that's facites. And uh, <clears throat> the uh, facites are, uh, of course, in these uh, CAIs, are much simply than, simpler than what you find in a typical, typical melts run. Uh, they can be described in terms of four components to an excellent approximation, that being diopside, grossmanite, which is the titanium 3 plus bearing beast, alumina buffonite, which is the 4 plus, titanium 4 plus bearing beast, and uh, calcium share marks. And most important is that Mark Giorso and I pointed out in 1994 that this alumina buffonite, decides, besides being a thermodynamically necessary component, is also a 
very good, uh, there are many reasons to pick it as opposed to what is the universal choice of the cosmochemical community, this calcium titan, titan aluminate. Well, most of you know that calcium titanate aluminate really isn't a pyroxene. It's, you could think of it as being at the center of the Romulan Empire because a large neutral zone of inaccessible composition space lies between it and the accessible or federation, if you like, composition space. You'll also note that uh, there is a large, uh, <clears throat> that there are these uh, two-phase tie lines that, uh, produced by Yang in what was, without a doubt, one of the best experimental studies I've ever seen. Long periods, very, very careful analysis. Those are real data. And they're basically symmetrically disposed between diopside and aluminum bifonite. And that indicates that this component here is the natural choice of an end member. It doesn't have a lot of configurational entropy. Perhaps none, but there, there will always be a little bit, but not enough to write home about. So it's a good end member. Another reason to do this is that you start to see things that you don't see if you pick this cream cheese or whatever it is component that is common. You start to see the influence of these buffonite gaps here. Uh, and I'll back up here a minute and note that, well, Mark, when we, Mark and I, when we treated this, we had a model that, you know, looks like this. It describes it to a crude approximation, but it doesn't uh, deal with features like closing of these gaps at about 20 mole percent. Uh, <clears throat> and we'll uh, deal with that in a minute. Uh, but here in this previous model, we didn't account for the mixing and disordering that takes place and ordering that takes place on the tetrahedral sites. So, but again, when if you take that analysis, that earlier analysis, and extend it and just look at that data, project all the CAI data through CATS onto this front face diopside Grossmanite alumina bifonite, boy, do you see those gaps between the uh, primary and secondaries, or those are primaries, you know, whatever, between the various facites. And in fact, I've emphasized this by connecting up our alumina bifonite gaps from before with hypothetical gaps here, diopside Grossmanite, uh, and then I should have tossed out this earlier data because it's really inaccurate. But that's a very interesting structure and you don't see it. No, nobody pays attention to this. Phase equilibrium isn't important to this community apparently. Uh, anyway, the, uh, <coughs> if you uh, look at this, of course this construction has is, is got to be bogus because we have a considering that disordering. And once you do the uh, mixing and disordering and the alumina and the tetrahedral sites, you're going to close these things off at very low cats or aluminum before, uh, or cats or uh, Grossmanite uh, contents. And uh, this is illustrated for the simple system dioxide, cats, uh, aluminum bifonite, and we calculate here that uh, you're going to close this thing at about five mole percent uh, cats. And so then these two phase tie lines must represent a second bufonite gap, if you like, in that simple system that closes at about 20 mole percent as indicated by these filled circles. Those are, and, and with temperatures, those indicate where you get homogeneous facites, whereas these two-phase tie lines, of course, indicate coexisting facites, and this black hoop represents our fit to that. Uh, but <laughs> you have to consider ordering here because if you just let it be disordered, you, you, know, you can sort of fit the gaps, but they don't close, and they, they, you produce big numbers. You can't have this. So, what do you do? Well, we've tried to describe everything with a <clears throat> uh, model uh, where we've taken a, uh, the suggestions of Victor Vinograd, but we have to take into account not only the disordering, but the, re the ordering that takes place on these sites, uh, and that's short range, but we've tried to use a long range order, convergent order parameter to describe them. That, uh, that this was Victor Vinograd's suggestion. And you can see we fit the uh, configurational entropy constraints at high temperatures of these uh, Cohen and Warren and Vinograd and others. But to do that requires a very large uh, quartic parameter here. And I'm going to uh, finish real quickly here. Uh, anyway, this works really well, but it, it doesn't allow us to reproduce the data from Newton and, and all, but it, it works pretty well for the later data. Uh, and of course, We've extended this, or extending it to the calcium aluminum inclusions, the exchange potential is appropriate to those. And, and uh, you know, but this is a work in progress. And it would be very helpful if we actually had composition data collected with this kind of critical thinking in mind. And we uh, plan to then use, uh, we plan to hopefully improve pyroxenes in melts eventually. That might be a little undertaking of uh, 
biblical significance, perhaps. But <laughs> the, and it, we're, we're, in the very least, we're going to try to develop a calibration for the titanium 3 plus, titanium 4 plus cosmobarometer, one that takes into account the truly profound energetic implications of these buffonite gaps. Uh, and anyway, we hope that these incremental improvements will lead to new insights of the kind envisioned by Norman Bowen. And I just want to thank the University of Washington and OFM Research and their friendly staff, Odie, Philo, Milo, and Owen, and conclude with a modified version of the jing former jingle of the DuPont Corporation that was, uh, was uh, co-opted by some San Francisco hippies in the 60s. And that is a motto that I will further modify to read better geosciences through mineral thermochemistry. Thank you. <laughs>